Look, ADHD sucks and it literally can ruin lives. As a psychiatrist, I have a lot of people ask me what ADHD medications are the best and if there are any alternatives with less side effects because they're worried that they could get hooked on stimulant medications and have to take them for the rest of their lives. In this video, we'll talk about how to decide which treatment is best for you based on the pros and cons of each option and the latest science on how to improve your focus with or without medications. This is really important because stimulant medications like Adderall can kick in very quickly and feel like they are doing something really powerful for your focus. But if we're being scientific about it, does that really actually reduce the symptoms of ADHD like distractibility, impulsivity, and procrastination as much as people think that it does? If you're watching this video, chances are that you or someone that you love has struggled with focus issues. Every week I have patients tell me how it basically ruins their lives with poor grades, missed work projects, and different difficulties in communication with their romantic partners. It really sucks and the thought that a medication could fix all this is really attractive because the research shows that these symptoms can make people more likely to develop depression or anxiety later in life because of poor performance and the repercussions that come from that. But does that mean that we should do things like put children on amphetamine salt so that they can focus better in school? It's a really complex and controversial issue and most parents would prefer to explore other ways to help their children rather than put them on these substances, so it's a really important topic. Now, treatment categories for ADHD are generally broken down into stimulant medications, non-stimulant medications, and ADHD psychotherapy. Each category has differences in mechanism of action, the amount of symptom reduction, perceived effect, and the duration of effect. Which one you decide to engage in really depends on your own individual needs. To understand these treatments, let's first talk about the neuro science behind ADHD so that we can see which one would be best for you. One analogy that people like to use for ADHD lately is like having too many tabs open on a browser window when you're on the internet. You're trying to accomplish this task, but you have all this information and keep switching from tab to tab and you end up not getting any useful information from each tab. And with all these tabs, you quickly get overwhelmed. The latest neuroscience brain imaging studies show us that we have different brain networks for different cognitive tasks. For instance, if you're paying attention to what's going on in front of you, like a colleague giving a work presentation, you're engaging in the salience network and you should be able to absorb and process that information coming from the outside environment. But if you're daydreaming or ruminating and not paying attention to what's going on in front of you, you're stuck in something called the default mode network. Normally people are either in the salience network or in the default mode network at one time and there's not too much switching back and forth. Brain imaging studies show us that people with ADHD have more crossover between these networks than the average person and there's difficulty in switching back and forth between these different brain circuitry networks. You may have heard of different neurotransmitters like dopamine or norepinephrine and these provide the brain juice or the fuel necessary to sustain focus in one network or the other. If you have a bunch of dopamine in your central nervous system, you're probably able to stay in the salience network with less amount of effort. That's how these stimulant medications work. They increase the amount of dopamine in your central nervous system, allowing you to stay in certain networks like the salience network for longer periods of time. But there's a lot of different things affecting these neurotransmitters. Poor sleep, poor diet, or lack of exercise can lessen the effectiveness of the neurotransmitters effects on your brain and make it more difficult to stay in one or the other to sustain attention properly with these brain circuits. Luckily, there are behavioral techniques that you can learn in ADHD psychotherapy that are sort of like guide rails that help you maintain focus in the appropriate brain state configuration for longer periods of time. So how exactly are people diagnosed with ADHD? In the not too distant future, we likely will have brain mapping and neurotransmitter studies to help us quantify your individual brain networks and needs. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet and we still need to rely on symptom questionnaires within the context of a clinical assessment to determine if someone meets the criteria for ADHD. Basically, if you have enough symptoms out of a predetermined ADHD scale questionnaire and have dysfunction in your life in at least two different settings like work and home as a result of them, you meet criteria for ADHD. So how do the ADHD studies work? 
To determine how effective different treatments are, medical scientists give ADHD patients surveys before, during, and after treatment. If the symptoms of ADHD on these subjective scales decrease after the intervention, the treatment is deemed a success and the researchers investigate further. A lot of the studies that I looked at deemed around 50% of reduction in ADHD symptoms for a treatment to be effective. So how do these treatments work? So like I referred to earlier, the ADHD medications tend to increase the concentration of neurotransmitters like dopamine or norepinephrine that help people activate and maintain the attention circuitry in their brain. ADHD psychotherapy trains people how to optimize their environment and their habits to give the biggest likelihood of being able to maintain that attention circuitry while trying to concentrate and complete tasks. Now, what most people don't realize and what really surprised me when I looked into it further is that meta study after meta study has found that the effect size of these three different types of treatments is about the same. That means you could try stimulants, non-stimulants, or ADHD psychotherapy and still get around a 50% reduction in ADHD symptoms from any one of those treatments. Meaning that the actual amount of reduction of symptoms of ADHD between them all is very similar. Now that's really counterintuitive because a lot of people swear that they've tried everything in the book and that the stimulants are the only thing that has fixed the problem. But there's other factors at play here, so let's unpack that. Stimulant medications like Adderall or Ritalin kick in almost immediately with a heavy emphasis on dopamine, but they also tend to wear off quicker and can create more physical dependence. Dependence. Also, when the medication is out of your system, the effects are gone. You're no longer going to be able to concentrate like you did when you were on the stimulant. And a lot of people undergo withdrawal symptoms, which is pretty nasty. They get low mood, low motivation for weeks afterwards because their brain had become reliant on that dopamine that they were getting from the medication. Non-stimulant medications like Wellbutrin or Atomoxetine take longer to kick in with more of a mix between norepinephrine and dopamine. The non-stimulant medications tend to be more gentle on your physiology and not cause as much physical dependence, but still after a month of not taking them, their effects pretty much wear off and leave you back at square one, kind of like the stimulants do, but over a longer time frame. So they're not as bad of an on-off switch as the stimulants, but still not as much of a long-term effect as psychotherapy can be. Psychotherapy for ADHD takes the longest to develop with studies showing about 20 weeks of psychotherapy to get symptom reduction. But what's really cool about the psychotherapy psychotherapy is the long lasting effects that can show symptom reduction one, two, three, even a lifetime of years after the treatment for some people. And I know that's difficult for some people to hear because of how powerful stimulant medications can seem. But according to this research, there's a lot of alternatives to the stimulant medications for ADHD treatment. People just feel like the stimulant medications work best because of how rapidly they work. There's a well-known psychological phenomena that the more quickly an intervention works, the stronger behavioral reinforcement we see. The patients notice the benefit of stimulants more immediately, but that doesn't mean that they are better for you over the long term compared to other evidence-based treatments like non-stimulants or psychotherapy. ADHD psychotherapy is a bit different than other types of mental health therapy in that it's primarily course and workbook based. This one called Mastering Your Adult ADHD was highly recommended on the Reddit forums, is evidence-based, and I thought it did a nice job of summarizing different techniques that a person can use to limit the impact of ADHD symptoms. It's like creating guardrails and a support system to help keep your ADHD symptoms in check. The book breaks these techniques into three main categories of organization and planning, managing distractibility, cognitive restructuring, and also has a bonus section on preventing procrastination. Organization and planning might sound a little boring, but I thought they did a great job in showing you how to use a calendar properly, build task lists, and have a triage system for emails and paperwork. It had this really cool way of writing down master task lists and then daily task lists and categorizing the items to break large projects into manageable chunks. 
In the managing distractibility section, it talks about setting reasonable work time lengths for focus and having a secondary to-do list to limit switching between tasks. Oftentimes when people are working on difficult projects, they have these random thoughts of other tasks that they need to do and end up switching gears to get those things done out of fear that they'll forget to do them. But that comes at the jeopardy of completing the main task at hand. We know that task switching burns a lot of time and mental energy and might prevent you from actually completing the main task. So if you have a list off to the side when you're doing the main task and get those random thoughts about other things you need to do, you just write it down on your side list so you can offload it from your mind and not worry about forgetting to do it later. This frees up your mind to focus on the main task at hand and it can really help a lot. The book also talks about controlling your work environment to limit distractions by doing things like creating a clear workspace, setting your phone to work mode, and there's a lot of digital tools coming out that can help you with that that I'll talk about here in a second. Then the cognitive restructuring module is really interesting because you realize that people with ADHD often have all these negative associations with their work performance. They have these automatic negative thoughts about how they're never going to complete the project, they're overwhelmed and they just want to give up. And the workbook talks about identifying these negative thoughts, analyzing them correctly, identifying them, and then reframing them in a positive way. Common thoughts that people have with ADHD is catastrophizing or all or nothing thinking, for example. And it teaches you how to write these things down so that you can unload those from your mind and free up the mental space needed for completing the actual project. At the end, it shows you how to apply all these skills to prevent procrastination, which is, I know, one of the biggest problems that comes with ADHD. ADHD. I think the book made an important point that you have to practice these things daily to have them become habits. Otherwise, these guardrails in your ADHD treatment may decrease with efficacy over time. For those of you who have been following this channel for some time, you know that I'm really into different neurotechnologies like the Neurable EEG headphones that can track your focus now and are coming out this spring. I'm personally really excited to test these strategies with the Neurable headphones to see how productive I can be by using these strategies. There's also some really powerful alternative behavioral training that you can do through meditation. Clinical trials, brain scan studies, and all kinds of research has shown that meditation can be helpful for symptoms related to ADHD. First of all, meditation trains you to enhance your focus. It also helps reduce impulsivity and help you maintain attention on a single point of focus, whether that's your breath, a mantra, or even a particular sensation in your body. You can train yourself to be more aware aware of your internal state and redirect your attention when you lose it from the meditation object. It also trains relaxed awareness and helps lower stress and anxiety, which can be prevalent in people with ADHD. It also can help break the cycle of these negative thought patterns and emotional reactivity, which are also big problems with people that have ADHD as well. Now, meditation can certainly be done at home without having to spend any money. There's a ton of free YouTube videos and resources to teach you about meditation. If you want to do a quick search, you'll find all kinds of content. I like to recommend to my patients check out the Headspace app. They do have a free trial and they have great strategies to help you start getting into meditation with some structure. I also get really excited about advanced meditation strategies using neurofeedback devices that can teach you how to get into relaxed attention alpha brainwave patterns and assist in enhancing your awareness of when your brain gets distracted and when it wanders by giving you cues through visual and audio feedback while it's monitoring your brain through EEG or FNIRS technology. So there you have it. There can be massive benefit from doing psychotherapy, taking medications, or both, along with alternative behavioral training like meditation, but only the behavioral strategies will have a long-lasting effect on your ADHD symptoms. If you can make the habit of practicing these behavioral changes every day, there really shouldn't be any reason that a person cannot get off stimulant medications or at least take a lower dose or a non-stimulant medication to help manage their ADHD symptoms. ADHD treatment is definitely complex. There's no single path to managing these symptoms. So often a blend of these three techniques is best for improving a person's individual attention needs. Hopefully as more home devices become available, we can start taking more biometrics and have even better ways of tracking attention to know what strategies work best for you. I hope this information was helpful. And if you want to learn more about the brain devices that I mentioned, click this video here and I'll see you on the other side.